Welcome to the ISO Show, dispelling myths and sharing tips for success to improve your business with ISO standards with your host, Mel Blackmore. Hello and welcome to the ISO Show. Well, today I'm joined by Richard Turner, who's the Head of Asset Management of Greater Anglia, which is a train operating company here in the UK. And we're going to be talking about his journey in relation to asset management and ISO 55001. Greater Anglia have been certified to this standard for a few years now, and they're actually a bit of a trendsetter as far as asset management and certification is concerned in relation to ISO 55001. So without further ado, welcome Richard. Hi guys, hi. Hi Mel. Hi, great, thanks. Good to have you on Richard. First of all, before we dive into kind of your experience in asset management, can we just talk about Greater Anglia and what they do for our ISO show listeners? So Greater Anglia were one of the first train operating companies to, to embark on a full repair and lease in 2012. That means full responsibility as opposed to the normal setup where it's network rail as the landlord and the train operating company as a tenant. So hence, asset management department was a first for a train operating company to have their own asset management department. So that was a, a really big thing for a lot of us that joined asset management. I came from network rail, joined asset management in a department where train operating company were leading from an asset management point of view. So it's fantastic for us. Really good. Yeah. Right. And can you just um, share with us a bit about your background as well then, please, Richard? You mentioned about you came from Network Rail. Yeah, so prior to that, I did a building surveying degree in about 2000, and then I joined Network Rail around that time, just after passing my degree. And I was there as an asset manager at the start, and then the senior asset manager, and then a root asset manager. I went right through the asset management field. And it was interesting because I was looking after five train operating companies when I say looking after, that was a portfolio. So we must have had about, oh, just over 300 stations to look after and depots. You had numerous depots and stations. So yeah, no, it was really interesting. So when the Greater Angler job came around in 2012, I jumped at it because it was a massive new challenge for me. It was a new thing for a train operating company to start off. The asset management department never existed before. The whole thing was fresh and I thought, yeah, really interesting going over to, uh, to join them and see what we could do. So for those listeners that aren't actually familiar with asset management, could you just kind of describe what it is and why is it important to an organisation? Yeah, it's an interesting point. So for the asset management side for Greater Angler, we look after the stations, depots, all the assets within the station demise that sit under our responsibility as opposed to network rail, maintain, renew, enhance. We look at longevity, asset remaining life, numerous things so we see ourselves from literally from inception to completion so where you can get projects that will come in and carry out works on your station we are like the landlord effectively so we approve the works and then the works are handed back to us as the custodian mm. so for an asset management point it's really really key that we're involved in every step of the way from, from design to construction essentially yeah it's uh, an interesting role and it's very varied it's so varied asset management you, you, one day you can get involved in a refurbishment of a waiting room and next day you, I was just off a, on a call a minute ago and it was about a brand new station that's going to be built in Bewley Park in Chelmsford and that's working alongside with Network Rail so it's so varied and I think that's what I love about the job really every day is different it's good yeah so it sounds as though you definitely need to work in collaboration with lots of different stakeholders from Network Rail through to the suppliers I guess the designers as well all the way through in terms of looking after that asset life cycle as well, isn't it? Yeah, massive. And that's, that's a key point, actually, because I think that's one thing you learn through asset management is, is meeting the expectations of your stakeholders and how you've done and what their expectations are, really. So, yeah, the stakeholder, internal and external, is vital, really, for any business to succeed. Because if you haven't got the buy for your stakeholders, then uh, you're going to really struggle. So really vital that is and I think you learn that along the way in this role definitely and I think especially in terms of a train operating company that you have a franchise agreement don't you yes and how long is that agreement for then to kind of maintain those so it's until 2025 
Yeah, it's an interesting one because the thing about asset management, you look at longevity and life cycle costs, etc. So in 2012, the original franchise for two and a half years. So the interesting point, and when you're specifying works or you're, you're renewing stations, etc., you always look for design life. You always look for that product that has got longevity, etc. So the R8 thing is a lot of assumptions are made that they're not going to make efficiencies because they're only here for two and a half years. But you see yourself longer because you see yourself winning the next franchise and the next franchise and so on. So it's really yeah. important that the amount of people make that assumption is quite interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think because it is a competitive environment, you need to demonstrate the long term yeah. strategic benefits as well so that you can renew on those contracts. So that's interesting, isn't it? Which I think is a win-win really, isn't it? All, all around. Yeah. Definitely. And getting the most out of those assets. Oh God, definitely. Yeah. For us going forward. Absolutely. From the whole life cycle cost, uh, our 30 year plan, maintenance, it's all trend analysis with regard to what they do in maintenance and what we do on renewals, etc. So it's all got to link in because, you know, you want to spend less in the future really, and you want assets to last and last. So yeah. Okay, cool. So let's dive into ISO 55001, because in the intro, I mentioned about you being a trendsetter in terms of ISO 55001 for train operating company. Could you just explain about why did you look at this standard? Why did you consider it both from, I guess, using it as a document to help you to improve asset management? Because that's generally why businesses implement ISO standards, because it's about raising their game. And also, why did you look at certification to the standard as well? I think we were looking for excellence, really. So when uh, we took over our franchise, there was only one other train operating company that I knew that were going through the standards. And I actually engaged with them. We were looking to definitely set up our within asset management to have that structure. And I remember one of the statements I was making to one of the consultants at the time, they were looking and asking us very much the same question. I said to them, I'd, I'd love to be you know, setting the trend so other train operating companies or any other company will come to us and go, you know, how did you do that? And could you give us some advice? So it's, uh, it, our journey was really, really interesting, which no doubt we'll talk about after. So yeah, it was really important for us and trying to get that into the DNA of your employees. That's one thing that, that I found interesting going forward. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting hearing that because regardless of the standard, because obviously on this podcast, we talk about lots of different ISO standards. That is always a challenge, regardless of the size of the business, the sector or the standard. I mean, at the end of the day, it is about change management in a lot of respects. So it's about how you kind of, really? yeah, the standard may say this is best practice, but it's like, how do you actually interpret that for your organization and get others to kind of take responsibility for it? So yeah, yeah it's not surprising to hear that that was a challenge and especially in a large organization where You've got lots of different roles and responsibilities yeah. within a business that kind of dovetail into asset management as well. So how did you go about tackling that then, Richard? There's numerous ways, actually. So uh, there was a massive sort of step change in, in everything we did with regards to presentations, with regards to training, with regards to updating our process strategy and getting everybody's buy-in and inductions in what they do within the company. So the, it was a massive sweep for us. And, and I think we got that from ISO in the structure, in how it was set out and what we do going forward. When I say it was a challenge within the guys, I don't think some people didn't really know that's actually what they're doing. So that saying that to me, then, actually, this is working now because I'm, I'm getting that into your day to day and you're actually doing that as a, as a day to day job or a day to day task. So yeah, massive step change for us actually. And, uh, and you can see yeah. the improvement with the, within the team and the structure more defined and the line of sight actually went, goes right that up to our managing director coming right down to the guy on the station. You can see that link. And I think that was the most impressive thing, actually, knowing that. Going on a, an ISO audit with BSI and, you know, they were speaking to, we went round one of the stations. So bear in mind, we renewed with Hans and refurbished stations. It was, he just went into the ticket office and he was speaking to uh, one of the platform staff. He just said, do you know much about the asset management and their asset management system? And he went, yeah. And for me, I'll sit there going, you see, it just went right down, right down to that level. And I thought, that's brilliant. And that, that's what I mean. It just goes to show it works, you know, the, how the standard works and literally just filters down. So um, it was working, yeah, for us. Yeah. 
And that doesn't happen overnight, does it? So, I mean, you know, I've got to commend you for finding lots of different ways to communicate with lots of different stakeholders. And I know I can remember, because I used to work for British Rail years ago. Obviously, this was pre-privatisation, so that just kind of shows how old I am. <laughs> As a railway trainee, and I did actually work in different areas within British Rail, like in a ticket office and that sort of thing. And it, it was fascinating, but I, I know that it was a challenge getting communications down the line so that everybody was, you know, singing from the same song sheet. And uh, I know that obviously when you're going through, I guess, you know, in terms of train operating companies, you have your own way of working. And it, again, I think it's about setting that standard as high as you possibly can, that's still realistic and achievable to be able to deliver on. But yeah, getting that communicated and then getting people kind of yeah. buying into it. It's, uh, I know it's a challenge, yeah. Definitely. It's very rewarding, actually, when you see it happening. It's really rewarding when you see that happening. So it's, it's interesting, definitely. And we've learned so many lessons from start. And as you know, Mel, when you met, met us at the start, we were in a different position to where we are now. So that was a massive learning curve for us and getting the structure right and, um, yeah, the stakeholder scene. And actually, just that's another thing what I didn't sort of take on board is when we were setting our policy just for asset management. So for, from a greater angler point of view, you've got a strategy and a policy. But... When we were setting hours out for our department, bear in mind you've got customer service department, asset management department, operations department, et cetera, and HR. So when we set up our policy strategy, I was showing it to some of the colleagues in, around the business in different areas, and they said, oh, I wish we had something like that. So we said, oh, you know, it's working then. So uh, that was really interesting to hear the feedback on it. So it wasn't just our guys, it's making sure the business knew what we were about and our strategy and our policy going forward. Yeah, I know that you work with a really broad range of different suppliers as well, from, you know, FM companies to all sorts of different kinds of suppliers. Mm -hmm. How do you think that that structure's helped you in having those policies and systems in place to kind of coordinate operations with those kind of stakeholders? Yeah. So one thing, when you mentioned it, one of the first thing that came to mind is when we started the franchise in 2012, we inherited the existing asset management system via Network Rail to avoid risk of the assets because a lot of that information stored is very similar to NR system and, and information could be passed over very easily. So through our franchise, what we found is the way the system worked and there were so many different things we wanted to do with that. So we went out to numerous companies and we looked at our team and rather than saying, uh, what annoys you about the system? We just said, actually, what do you want it to do for you, commercial team? What do you want it to do for you, project team? What do you want it to do for you, assets and, uh, and so on? And they came back with lots of feedback and then, and that kind of went out into a tender to all contractors, et cetera. So it was interesting to see what I never thought that I thought one company will come back. Yeah, we can do all of that. And what we found out over the, the coming months is that wasn't possible because we were asking for so much. So we ended up getting three uh, companies in to do different elements of the system. So that was quite an interesting thing for us uh, going forward because that's something that we'd never thought that would be the case so not that it matters for us all right it's different with regards to managing it but but now we've got it in place it's fantastic so that was interesting but our supply chain no it's uh it's very consistent actually with regards to our supply chain and fm have got our framework contract and that's going well and there's a link to our system with regards to reactive and renewals etc so um yeah it's an interesting it's challenges at the time and yeah, it's interesting. What I love to see from contractors and tenderers when they come in is innovation. So you could put a tender out to numerous contracts and they could just read your specification or design and say, actually, yeah, no, I can deliver that. But it's great when you see someone coming and go, I can deliver that. But I'll tell you what, the way I can deliver that is slightly different. And here you go. Exactly. Yeah. So thinking ahead and proactively, which is, yeah, absolutely. And obviously that can then link back to your asset management plan as well can't it and yeah definitely 100 percent. yeah and that goes back to what we were saying earlier about being trendsetters so it's not just about necessarily ticking the box in terms of we need this delivering and what else you know could that potentially deliver for us longer term and making this an awesome asset not just an asset it's going to be able to deliver and some as well great so just finally then, what are the kind of benefits that you've seen as a result of having that asset management system in place then, Richard? Oof, there's numerous. <laughs> We're fantastic. <laughs> no, uh, there's absolutely loads. Um, the benefits is, is literally from our surveys, because essentially prior to setting up our new system, everything was in different, it was managed completely different. 
So what we've got it is now one big unit that just manages everything. So it's all linked effectively. So information with mm. regards to surveys, information with regards to renewals, information with regards to stakeholder project third party, it's all linked and the, the communication is all linked. So whereas before it would have been harder to manage because you're going to different places to try and obtain that information. So now it's all unified really in that sense. So it's Yes, that must save you quite a lot of time then. And because I know that you have to report to various stakeholders yes. uh, in your position, Richard. So having all of that information at your fingertips and how it all connects with other areas of the business must be really helpful. And also it gives you that transparency and visibility, not just on the day-to-day -day operations, but longer term and projections, doesn't that? Absolutely. And that's key for us because one of the criteria of our a new franchise was to set up a 30 year plan. And then the way we've worked in the past, it was always a five year plan, look ahead like CP6, CP7. So it was interesting for us, we were thinking, actually, how did he do so 30 years? That's a long way off. Yeah. So it's interesting to work that out with regards to asset condition, looked at the longevity, looked at what we were proposing, and we're measured on a sort of station stewardship measure. Then you got a percentage asset remaining life of that, which the DFT liked to see. And they showed you that sort of projection and it showed you that condition of those individual assets you were maintaining to a certain degree. So, so you could get some train operating companies could come in and say, right, I've got stakeholders to please. What I'm going to do is sweat all those assets and spend very bare minimum and I'll just tick along and our stakeholders will be beneficial. We never did that with a complete reverse. We looked at it like we've got this. It's a 99 year lease, but our franchise was, I think it was about six or seven years. So initially it was no, we're going to look ahead, way ahead, like we're going to keep winning every franchise, invest, look for massive efficiencies. Yeah, so it was really good, actually. It was good that everybody had that same drive in looking way ahead beyond your franchise. So the next incumbent that come in will go, actually, I've got something that saves, because it, it's, it's DFT involved significantly. So um, it was really good, and they love to see that from us, really. We reported back to the DFT each month and showing the progress that we made with regards to our renewals, enhancements. No, it's really good and lots and lots of innovation as well because we have monthly meetings I mean, sit down and look at new products out there, what's happening out there, what our other business is doing. So it's just trying to keep abreast and I suppose that goes back to what you originally said at the start, sort of um, being the trendsetter. Yeah, absolutely. And everything that you've just been describing, it, it's all about continual improvement, isn't it? So you kind of never stop improving. And having that system, I guess, enables you to be able to make those plans, projections and to monitor the results against it. Because I know that obviously you've, you've had ambitious plans there and, you know, it's, it needs a lot of organisation and control to be able to manage those deliverables as well. Oh, God, massively. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. But it's good to see that line of sight. And it's good to see, I think every time you guys audit us, it just gets better and better and better. I was thinking, God, oh, compared to when it, <laughs> we first started. And to where we are now, it was amazing to see. Yeah, no, it was really good to see that actually. I remember when we were first setting out our uh, policy, one of the things I did find, it was interesting because one of the things that we've, we've never rail always did, and we started to do the same thing. It was all about asset condition, always about asset condition. It was always, you measured based on your asset condition. So then you build up your renewals plan and saying, actually that's at its end of life. Now I'm going to renew it. It's got another 25 years and so on. So what we did, we incorporated is the people factor and how that links to the people. So, Because if I spend a million pound on a platform, the passenger might not see that at all. He'll see a 30,000 pound waiting room that he's going to sit in. That's more of an impact to that person. So the, the idea was how do you get that link and, and to, to get their buy-in or to see what really has an impact on the passenger. And that's what we tried to do actually going forward, which was quite a new thing actually, getting the two to link. So yeah, and I think we've done pretty well at that going forward. And that's a learning curve for us. So it's interesting how you've kind of weaved in the customer journey into the asset management process. Oh, so just last question, if I may then. I know you've got a wealth of knowledge and experience in asset management and ISO 55001 now as well. Are there any hints or tips, you know, if an individual that's responsible for assets within an organisation and then they're considering implementing some kind of framework to pull all of that together and have that structure, and they're thinking about ISO 55001. What kind of hints and tips would you give them for consideration? Contact Blackmore straight away. That's what I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> no, and that's no, not a joke. To say that. <laughs> no, no, I, that's not a joke. And the reason why I say that, because I will never forget when we first started looking at the journey, I remember speaking to the only other train operating company that was going through it. 
So we were looking into the, uh, the ISO accreditation, etc. And, and they said to me, have you got help? I said, what, what help? I said, you're going to need some <laughs> help. You get someone in to help you. And that's when we, we obviously, we engage you guys. And that's when our kind of life changed and you, you know, and you showed us the way. So I couldn't even imagine just doing it on our own, <laughs> going out there and, and trying to achieve it, which we assumed we could do in the first place. Thinking, oh yeah, we're streets ahead. I'm sure we can do that. And I think that's the time when you realize when someone comes in and looks at your setup and how your structure is and your strategy, et cetera, and then they go, well, this is what you've got. This is what you need. And you think, wow, okay. Now you can see the step change of what's required. So that was really beneficial for us when you guys came and you just went, you know, I won't mention what you said to us, Mel, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, uh, yeah, it was a massive, we've come a long, long way from when we first started to company to where we are now. It's, but I think it has to be said though, Richard, there are areas that you've gone way above and beyond the standard and we're like, oh yeah, we've, we've done this, we've done this, we've been doing this for years. So, you know, a lot of it was like, yeah, we've got that. Yeah, we got that. But then there are areas, and this is the same for all yeah. businesses that haven't actually introduced mm. a standard. I think the daunting prospect is actually looking at that standard as a technical specification thing. How is this going to be interpreted for our business? And so I think that's all we help to do there really. Yeah, you're right though, but it's, it's funny you say that because that's exactly how I see it. You're still some areas you really excelled in mm -hmm. and others didn't. And that's where the, the standard helped you. You say, actually, this is what you need, literally. And even killed right across the, and so you thought, actually, yeah, I get it. I do get it mm -hmm. now. So, yeah. yeah. Great. Well, it's great to see that and hear that you're still setting that bar really high and it's going from strength to strength, Richard. That's fantastic. And I think you must be almost up to your third year recertification, aren't you, coming yeah. up? Yeah. Here we are, third year, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so well done for that and congratulations. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Excellent. Well, thanks very much for being a, a fantastic guest on the ISO show, Richard. No worries, I enjoyed it. Brilliant. Well, that's all from me for now and from Richard Turner, the Head of Asset Management of Greater Anglia. Don't forget to leave any reviews or any suggestions, hints and tips on what you'd like to hear in future episodes on the ISO show. But until then, I look forward to catching up with you on the next ISO show. Looking to use ISO standards to drive better business practice? Contact us at blackmoresuk.com to access further information and book your free 15-minute call.